For the vast majority of human existence on Earth, 350,000 years by recent estimates, people lived in tribal societies. Most of those societies at least spent part of their time as circular in terms of social organization, though scholars do debate egalitarian and hierarchical fluctuation in terms of social organization. This essentially meant that these gatherings of individuals lacked permanent coercive hierarchy. Chiefs, kings, queens, emperors, dukes, earls, prime ministers, presidents, and all the layers and layers of strata associated with them are relatively recent inventions if we look at the totality of the human experience. One of the primary practices that helped maintain circular social organization for hundreds of thousands of years was what we call matrilinealism. Like most species, as well as earlier hominids, early humans learned how to meet their needs through observation and then testing, or trial and error. Needless to say, environment played the biggest role in developing various practices, as observing how to secure food or water in the desert versus the rainforest would require a very different methodology, for example. That said, the one need that was not wholly dependent on the ecosystem was that of procreation. While there's no denying the biological imperative part of the equation that constitutes this as a need, our focus here is on both the ideal and the practical. In short, procreation maintains the integrity of the society in question. New individuals replace old and the circle remains intact. Given that observation was humanity's most important tool for learning, it's no shock that humans understood fairly immediately that the individuals most necessary to quite literally reproduce their respective circles were women, the life givers and sustainers. So how do these observations lead to matrilineal societies? I mean, in practice, we all know how babies are made. When a woman really loves a man, or maybe there's a stork, maybe something about birds and bees. Regardless, there's the act of conception. The important part of matrilineal societies, however, is that most times women had the opportunity to choose the partner, and moreover, the number of partners they had. Without modern medicine, there wasn't a way to really diagnose male infertility or carriers of problematic genes. Infant and even motherly mortality rates were pretty high, so having as many opportunities as possible was practiced. Limiting oneself to one lifelong partner proved insufficient to maintain the circle. It doesn't mean the difficult to define, but very real feelings of love or lust didn't exist. We all make connections. Still, for bringing new life to maintain the social bonds of the group, it didn't factor as heavily as it does now. And if we're honest, it really is a contextually novel phenomenon. Even hierarchy-based societies maintained arranged marriages for lineage purposes the world over until quite recently in the human experience. Under these auspices, once a child was born, again, through what we can observe, the only surefire identifiable parent was the mother. Society actually watched them give birth. The male contributor might have been any number of possibilities. Further, if we're honest, who really put in all the work into this process? The man's part was relatively short, perhaps mere minutes unless he had a few too many shots that day. The woman, on the other hand, spent the better part of a year growing life. And even after birth, there's very little a man can immediately provide the child. There was no formula back then, so again, the mother literally sustained life for sometimes years after. Don't ask a historian or a sociologist why men have nipples. That's a question for another class. Still, these societies operated on reciprocity, and there was a keen understanding of the values that males brought to the raising of children. But since there was a good chance they didn't know exactly who the biological father was, and they still wanted male influence in the rearing of that child, they found the best and identifiable male influence should come from the mother's side, her line, hence matrilineal. Often they would choose the closest male relative, mostly around the same age experience. Her brother, though her father, maybe even cousins, might also serve that function. In the meantime, it's highly likely that this individual might also have biologically fathered another child that's being raised by that mother's brother or father or cousin. Again, the same can be said of that person. They fathered another child and the cycle radiates outward, forming the first social organization, the family circle, not a family pyramid like later in modern societies. Keep the circle in mind as we later dive into how natural democracies function. Through these, all too briefly explained thousands of years of experience, trial and error, circular people sought a sustainable and reciprocal relationship with each other to ensure their society could be reproduced and maintain a sustainable amount of parts that all play an equal role in the acquisition of production of needs, a circle. Given these certain material realities, social organization naturally followed suit and thus so too did political organization. In this spirit, most of these societies were also matrilineal. Biological observation not only dictated that women perform the lion's share of creating life, but also sustaining it. 
Women were quite literally the most important perpetuators of the family and thus society. In certain geographic cases, materially speaking, women were also a primary contributor of calories for the whole of society as foragers were often exponentially more successful than hunters in sustaining the life of the family, the clan, or the tribe. It must also be noted that recent findings in South America reveal women likely hunted regularly in many Neolithic groups. Naturally, their importance dictated that they should have at least have equal, if not more say, in the functions of their society, the distribution of its resources, and how bonds were maintained to ensure its success. It's not uncommon for other extremely social species to operate matrilineally either. Orcas, elephants, even wolves, despite the misconceptions about alphas and omegas, organize around matrons. As time passed and these societies proved more and more successful as well as sustainable, observation and testing gave way to mere socialization. To more efficiently engage in these processes, circular societies gave birth to language, representation, ritual, tradition, i.e. culture. In the interest of not only survival, but reproduction of culture, circular groups passed practices and knowledge down through stories that synthesized material realities with ideals and thus generated circular belief systems. Think back to our video on ethically constitutive stories and the role they serve. It's no coincidence that many of the earliest oral traditions celebrate the creative process, contain mostly, if not all female identifying deities or gender the natural world a certain way, mother nature for simplicity's sake. Even many of the earliest forms of material representative culture are mostly about fertility and goddesses, the Venus of Willendorf or the earliest Cycladic statues being a few examples. The stories, the art, they clearly indicate the import of women served in the survival of circles. Keep in mind, we have much more recent examples of these narratives to further evidence matrilinealism's import. Many, many First Nations were matrilineal when colonizers showed up and began making observations about this practice so different from theirs. Many remain matrilineal to this day. There are also current matrilineal societies that survived colonial onslaught in Southeast Asia, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, South America, and even a few small enclaves of Europe. So what happened? Well, many point to the agricultural or Neolithic revolution as a major transition for many, many things, one of which was the slow and indeed violent transition to patrilinealism and eventually outright patriarchy. We'll go into much greater detail in the next unit or check out our video on social hierarchy. But in short, it boils down to the desire to control what came to be known as surplus. It's no coincidence that groups going through this transition would have violent competitions for chief status and begin to champion warriors, conflict, and male deities in ethically constitutive stories. It's also no coincidence that certain practices, such as marriage, became prominent during this time. Men now held sway over women because of the gravity given to surplus, and since they either traded for it or killed for it, they wanted to ensure it remained theirs. One way to ensure it would be passed down properly was to ensure that it remained in the man's bloodline, and the only way ancient through modern men could ensure that was by limiting the amount of allowable partners women could have to one. Cue the infinite examples of narratives then and now that glorify purity as it pertains to women from Pandora to Medusa to Sita to Eve to Mary clean through to a modern nation still grappling with bodily autonomy. It's clear that these stories and the power they upheld stuck.